Welcome to Squatch Zone Radio. Be sure to stay tuned tonight, June 8th, 11 p.m. The existence of strange things. Sunday, June 9th, 8 p.m. Paranormal Files. Correction, June 9th. Make it June 10th for the Paranormal Files. Make sure you set and mark your calendars for June 30th and July 1st. ETPRO's first annual Virginia Bigfoot Conference is taking place in Fishersville, Virginia at the Augusta Expo. You're not going to want to miss it. Make sure you're there. Tonight, we have our guest, Mr. Fred Kenny, he'll be joining us live tonight. We will be talking about the population of Bigfoot here in Virginia. And we will be taking callers, so if you're listening, um, call in number will be area code 657-383-1713. Again, that is 657-383-1713. All right, and now we are live on Squash Channel Radio. My co-host this evening is not even here because uh, he said he was going to be calling in from the woods and from his base camp. So I don't know what's going on with Mr. Uh, Zach Sterick. He's kind of MIA at the moment. So uh, I actually do have a my other co-host that's normally with us, uh, Mr. Baldemar Galvan Jr., um, he actually just contacted me. I think he'll be on his way in here very shortly. Um, so as we wait on him, um, oh, hold on. He's actually still messaging me. Um, yeah, he. I think he's going to be working his way in, Mr. Baldemar Galvan Jr. Um, so... And Zach, uh, my co-host Zach actually just messaged me. He said he's finishing dinner and he'll be there in like 10 minutes. So <laughs> it's all good. Baltimore has an excuse because he wasn't familiar with tonight's show. So um, and Baltimore is going to get himself situated. So he'll be with us here in just a few minutes. So uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind everybody for tonight, um, you know, Call-ins are welcome, please. If you call in, um, we had uh, some crazy call-ins on last on the last show. We had the phone lines were blowing up. We had callers calling in left and right, um, and the phone calls got a little crazy. Um, <laughs> anything's possible. We do not know what to expect tonight. So please, if you're listening, um, we advised. We don't mind having fun on here. Don't get me wrong. We have no problem having fun on the show. But um, well, if you're calling in, if you want to share your opinion about something, or if you have questions for the uh, for our guest or anybody on the on the on the show, please uh, don't hesitate to call in to ask. That's what we're here for. We love a discussion. Um, we're all open minded, and we you know we like to share things to spread awareness. And that's what we that's what we're here to do. So. I, um, at this moment, uh, while we are waiting on Zach and Baldemar to join in with us, um, I want to welcome Mr. Fred Canny. Fred Canny, you are now live here on Squatch Show Radio. It's been a long time since we've uh, actually chatted on a live 
YouTube podcast or anything. So how you doing, Fred? Oh, I'm doing good. How about yourself? Oh, uh, not bad, not bad. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I want to. Uh, yeah, I got some. Uh, I want to. Uh, you you know about this? Uh, I am now being sponsored by Zero Tactical Gear now. Really? And uh, yeah, uh, they approached me and everything, and uh, I want to uh, thank them for sponsoring me for. They they noticed the way we research and everything, and they're uh, going to be supplying me with uh, tactical tactical stuff, you know, like backpacks and you know different things like that. I'll be knowing about it further on in a week and everything, you know. But I want to thank them guys for sponsoring me. You know, it's a new company out, and they've already is for you know like the military, the police, the fire department, first aid, even people going out in woods, you know, survivalists. You know, it's got all that stuff there, you know. And it's good for yeah. everybody. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because our, anyone who attends our event has a chance to meet them because they're actually going to be at our event so, as yeah, a vendor. Well, so yeah, well, he's a good he's a good friend of mine. His name is uh, well, I, I can't say his name on air, but uh, you will you will meet him. He's one of the he's a real good friend of mine, you know. And I haven't talked to him in like maybe two years. We used to coyote hunt together. Yeah, actually, well, they don't have no mind. Uh, they actually appreciate. I, I was actually promoting them by sharing their uh, their website yeah. and uh, and their logo yeah. on my on my event page. So there's a uh, actually uh, there's a couple different names. One's the vice president. One's the main uh, the main big guy. Uh, Keith Wheeler is yeah, one of them, yeah. and then yeah. Charlie Henley or something like that. I believe is the other name. So um, yeah, yeah, Charlie's the friend of mine. Oh, okay, cool. That yeah, is so uh, awesome. Yeah, it is, man. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'll be I'll be talking to you more about it later on, but you'll see everything on the thirtieth. Okay. Yeah. Sound, uh, that and sounds that sounds awesome. A, yeah, it does, man. Yeah, but I tell you, the, right now, it's that right now this year in my area is I mean it's blowing up because. The last, we camped out a couple of weeks ago, and I'm gonna tell you, the last two nights we were there, we got our we got our minds blown, man. They were everywhere. But the problem was, there were three guys across the road shining flashlights and burning the fire and feeding gas to it, and the squatches was on our side. You could hear them right next to our camp, breathing, grunting, growling. They were throwing rocks across the road at them and everything. It's the guy thought we were doing it. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, I remember yeah, the I, Facebook live that Connie was uh, saying she was talking about that <laughs> that incident. So, um, yeah, well, we're gonna, uh, we're actually going to get into all that here very shortly. Um, our uh, better late than never um, co-host, Mister Zach Sterick, finally showed up. <laughs> How you doing, Zach? Uh, I'm doing all right. I I misread the time. I thought I uh, thought you was going to be doing it at a regular scheduled time, not an hour early. And I was sitting oh. in there uh, hanging out with Brian and eating supper. Oh, it's all good. The only reason the only reason I did an hour early tonight is because at eleven there's another radio show that's being aired tonight at eleven. But I was uh, it was one of the shows that I was on. They're they're releasing it tonight, so that's why I did that. So. Because uh, I got the link shared on my timeline for that show. It's called uh, "Existence of Strange uh, of Strange Things." So, and uh, so, which actually that reminds me. There, that reminds me of a few announcements I want to go over real quick too that I did not throw up in the beginning uh, during the intro. Um, as far as upcoming shows, yeah, like tonight at 11 p.m., the "Existence of Strange Things" airs. Um, oh, then this Sunday. Yeah, this Sunday, which is uh, the tenth, I made a I made an error earlier, in the, but so yeah, Sunday the tenth at eight p.m. Um, I will be live on Paranormal Files, <laughs> um, and then actually they got me scheduled in for Paratalk Radio September twenty fourth, so which is that's awesome. Um, as far as upcoming events, we all know again about the June thirtieth and July first. It's a two day conference. The ECBRO's first annual Virginia Bigfoot Conference. 
uh, taking place in Fishersville, Virginia at the Augusta Expo. Um, for those who are attending that and want to participate with that, don't forget June 29th, which is a Friday, where uh, if you want to go for the Bigfoot hike, meet up at the venue parking lot, and I'll escort you out to Fred Canny, who will be leading that hike. Um, and then, of course, join us, participate to the, for the two-day event, and then we're camping for a whole week after that. July 2nd through the 7th is our annual ECBO camping expedition. Um, so if you plan on being a part of that, uh, please come on out. The event's free. All we ask is you bring your own food, gear, shelter, and all your equipment. Um, and then other events that I have marked down September 15th in, uh, at the Medoc mountain state park in North Carolina, uh, for the third annual Bigfoot at the park event. Um, for, for those who are familiar with that, that's been going on for the last couple of years. Uh, they're having the third annual event coming up this September. Um, I will be speaking, uh, um, down at that event in North Carolina. And then February 24th, which is, you know, uh, eight months away, um, February 24th, 2019, Rochester, New York, uh, is having their uh, Rochester Parafest, which is uh, hosted by um, Ted Sun, which is the host of Paratalk Radio. And uh, so I will be there as well, uh, speaking there at Rochester, New York. Which that should be interesting. So, so I don't know. Um, that's gonna we'll see how that works out. I might run into Ryan Reading up there. So <laughs> that would be uh, that would be cool. Um, but yeah. So those are some announcements I want to go over and cover. Uh, it's kind of exciting that this is all those are happening. Um, and then I want to make sure everybody understands uh, tonight's guest, Fred Canny. Um, uh, he's the Virginia uh, uh, Bigfoot researcher uh, here in the Shenandoah Valley, and um, we, you know Fred's been doing Bigfooting for you know a long time, and he has a lot of experiences. And uh, what we're gonna do, you know, one thing I've heard, I'm sure Fred's heard this. I know I have, and I'm sure others probably have too that don't even live in Virginia. But I think Virginia is so underestimated, and people kind of. So there's some I believe there's some people out there that kind of look down on Virginia like there ain't no Bigfoot in Virginia you know they got that mentality and boy do they don't you know they have no clue and uh, I mean Fred let me ask you have you ever experienced that has anybody ever you know like as far as people think like that to you or, or have they ever mentioned like that that, that would be too imp- impossible for Bigfoot to exist here in Virginia yeah, they said that, and I said, well, you know, we got a new name for Virginia now. It's called Virginia is for Squatch Lovers. Yeah. <laughs> way now, there, there is about 40, I'm just going to take a wild guess here, about 45 to 60% more Squatches on the East Coast now than there was since the 1970s or 60s. Because if you look at the Bigfoot map, if you look at the one from, if you look at the Bigfoot map from 1969, 1970, you'll see about maybe eight or ten squashes up down the whole East Coast. Now they're working. The whole East Coast is getting filled up from from uh, Maine or Vermont all the way down to Key West, Florida, and right now it's spread over right about around to the Mississippi line, getting ready to cross mm. the Mississippi line on the population of squashes that are being seen and reported by individuals up and down the East Coast. Wow. Well, you know, and I know I know you alone, and not just me, because I know, well, I've, as far as hearing other people's stories that, uh, where they've had their own sightings, encounters, and experiences right here in Virginia, um, you know, I've met up with other people who had claimed to have seen them along the, you know, the parkway, uh, and other locations is, you know, on the outskirts of the Shenandoah Valley here. And, uh, you know, just to hear other people's stories, you know, was awesome. It was exciting. It always blew my mind. It's like, you know, when they tell you a story about where, the, where they've seen them, I was like, wait a minute, I can't there. You know, it was like, it, it kind of excites you. It builds up that, you know, builds up that, um, uh, I don't know, it kind of builds up adrenaline in a way. So, yeah. Now you know the, that some 
Now, you know that spring and summertime is the best time for squatches. Now, the best people you can talk to are the people who hike the Appalachian Trail in the summertime. Like, during the summertime, like, if you go down to Wheezy's down in Waynesboro, you'll always right. see hikers from the Appalachian Trail. And those are the people you want to talk to. Because oh, yeah. Those, those are, I mean, last uh, last summer we talked to about maybe 35 or 40 different hikers, and I asked them certain questions, and they kind of give me a funny look, and then I would say, like, a wolf, a knock, or maybe a rock climber, and like, yeah, 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 you know, and they would describe where they was at and what they heard and how they how it was it come about and everything, you know. And they start, you know, and then they come in to answer your answer. They, you know, they start giving you these hints that you that you know that they're telling the truth and everything, you know. But hikers are the main ones that you need to talk to in the summertime. Like anywhere, like if you see hikers coming off the Appalachian Trail, whether on top of the Parkway or down at Weezy's Kitchen, or see them walking up and down 250 coming in out of Waynesboro, those are people you need to talk to. That's what oh, you yeah. need. Actually, you know, because, you know, they're, they're, you know I've, I've talked to one guy who he hiked the complete Appalachia Trail from one end to the other, and he says he really didn't know anything, you know, until I started saying, I started dropping a little, you know, like, um, like, you know, you heard maybe something following you, or you might have heard a rock clock, or you might have heard some chattering or something. He said, yeah, I did hear a lot of chattering and stuff like that. I said, what it sounded like? He said, it sounded like a bunch of people talking, like, way off in the distance. I said, okay, you know, that, that, yeah, that sounds about right, you know. But, you know, those are the people you need to talk to. Yeah, you uh, yeah. Well, you know, you you're right. Uh, I've actually approached him a couple times. Uh, I've actually seen him, uh, Appalachian hikers, Actually, coming from the Chinese restaurant, actually in Waynesboro, um, yeah, yeah. which is well, all within that general area. Um, well, the other thing is, I'm hearing stories that are being gathered by uh, there's a YouTube user. Uh, he also goes by the same name on Twitter, uh, Blue Ridge Bigfoot. Uh, his uh, his real name, yeah, his real name's Tim. Uh, He's oh. very awesome. He's a very cool guy. Uh, he'll he will be attending the conference. Um, cool. Now, Tim, the Blue Ridge Bigfoot. Now he covers. He'll give you stories. You know, like in North Carolina, surrounding it. But his main thing is a lot. Of, you know, probably ninety percent of his stories are all here in Virginia. And I, I, the more I started listening to him, I was like, man, this is good stuff. I mean. You know, down. You know, stories come from Dinwiddie, whatever. You know, I mean, he's got stories coming all within the this old Central Virginia area, and um, yeah. you know, give or take some here or there. But, but um, his stories that he's gathered are from real eyewitnesses. You know, people from Virginia here. Um, some of them, if you listen to some of the stories he tells, he'll, he'll use other names because some of them have been asked to, that they do not want the real name. You know, shared, which you know that's understandable. Yeah, um, yeah me and Connie, me and Connie was uh, up there uh, between Mid Springs and Kangaroo Truck Stop this evening talking to uh, Charlie. And yeah. Connie looked across the road and saw a juvenile sitting in the woods up there watching us. Oh wow! Down yeah, on the Mid Springs side. It, yeah, it's on that road. It goes between. You know where Ebers uh, Antique. Cars are up there in uh, Mint Springs. Okay, yep, yep. Well, when you turn off Route 11 and go up that little back road, it takes you right by the Evers car place. There's a patch of woods on your left, left hand, right hand side, right up in there. And I know that oh. patch of woods. Well, yeah, there was right. Up, there was one right up there. She said she saw him sitting there. Because I, well, I was sitting, I was talking, when I was talking what, to Charlie, what? I was. Oh no! I was going to ask you, what's another area? What's another name of it that's a area that's close to that area? That um, Greenville isn't Greenville over t- towards that way? Greenville is about maybe uh, seven miles up further. Because if, okay. if, you, if you go up to the main intersection, take a take a uh, take a left that takes you from Mid Spring to Stewart Strand. Yeah, because uh, there's a lot of document. Uh, I mean, well. I shouldn't say a lot, but there is reports online documented from out of Greenville. Yeah. 
And yeah, I have is. actually heard stories in person from people about in that area. Yeah, so. because they, the National Forest kind of kind of filters out, not all the way, but, you know, just bits and pieces of it, go up into Greenville where prior property meets National Forest and everything. Right, you know, yeah. As you, as, you, yeah, as you know, they migrate the Appalachian Trail and the Blue Ridge Parkway, they come down like into my area where the birthing area is, and they, you know, and they're just not in my area or Santa Mary's. So they're all filtered out because I'm hunting over on uh, right there, 795, 796 in Augusta County, and I'm finding footprints, hair, and tree structures in this small patch of woods that I'm hunting. So they're they're, hmm. they're out everywhere, you know, but they're traveling at nighttime. What they're doing oh, is they're yeah. hitting patches of woods. They're hitting patches of woods as they're traveling, you know, migrating or something like that, you know. Might be a male looking for a female. I don't know, you know. But me and my friend Joe, he's seen them too, you know, the footprints and everything. Very uh, first awesome. Time I seen them, first time I seen them was last year. I'm like, wait a minute. There's a footprint here. We measured it, and it was uh, 13 inches and about 5 feet, 10 feet to the or to the right, there was a, there was a big X stuffed in between two trees that you couldn't even begin to pull them apart. They're like, wow, man. Yeah, you know. So, so well, you know, well, I'm going to get you talking here a little bit more here so shortly, but I want to share something real quick that, you know, I know you share your stories um, a lot, and then I want everybody to know for the record that where Fred um, mainly researches in camps, with his experiences that take place there, I personally have spent a lot of time there, uh, both with Fred and without Fred. Um, I've done a lot of hiking on my own, um, either by myself or I've had my daughter out there with me. And um, But there's been, I can tell you, probably one, two, three, I mean, actually four, maybe five. <laughs> actually, there's been quite a few experiences that I've had alone um, and then not just experiences but I have found tracks and you know and I found I've had I have seen this the the Sasquatch sign that they're believed that they have left behind and well, minute, this Dad. is all no. oh, go Daniel. ahead go ahead yeah you remember the vi- remember the video you did Squatch with Fred and Connie you videoed that, was- that juvenile sitting you you videoed oh, the juvenile yeah. sitting right smack in front of you because me and Connie yeah, said because we the tree you were the, yeah you, we was uh, sitting there or standing there and we was talking like we were real close then you followed us over then you panned back and you zoomed in for about five to ten seconds and what you videoed was a juvenile Sasquatch sitting right out in the open to make to a tree. Oh that yeah, that's the one I've ever seen. Well, you know, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. I have, you know, I've like I've been on the trail up behind Kennedy Fields where I've seen movement up on the hill, and yeah. you know, the thing is, even though I was, you know, I seen the movement up on the hill there, and you know, at that time, all I had was a cheap camera phone, to, you know, and the, the picture wasn't the best, the the video quality was not the best. But at that time, I was excited, knowing that I was seeing movement of whatever it was was playing and moving up on the hill. Um, you know, I, I could have easily ruled that out as, oh, it was a small bear playing around up there. But it was followed by other activity that said, that's not bear activity. That's not bear, you know, behavior. Because after I left that location, went further deeper in, uh, after crossing that creek to go towards that picnic area back there, I had a yeah. I had a large a large rock that got thrown into the creek right next to me, and it was I mean it was it was a big rock and you could hear the splash and the force of it dropping into the creek you know, and then after I come back through the woods to kind of investigate to see what where uh, where it came from, did not see nothing but after coming out to the uh, the edge of the creek to look to see if I could see anything, you, you know just so so far in the woods you hear whoop you know so yeah. Something tells me there there was something there that was not a bear. So bears do not throw rocks like that into the creek, and they won't whoop at you. <laughs> so that was just one of my experiences 
And the others are responses from tree knocks that I've had. I brought Michael Cook in there, you know, and he, we've had experiences. We have responses from his tree knocks. And these are just little things that we've experienced together, you know, uh, or just in general. So, so basically, you know, for anyone, you know, that says that you don't have squatches in your area, I can vouch. There's squatches there. I have found the, you know, tracks on numerous occasions. I've had the experiences. I've heard the vocalizations. I've heard the whoops. I've had tree knocks. My daughter has experienced it with me. It's all there. So, you know, so with now that you, being said, oh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Fred. Now you just need to sit at the camp with us. Right. If, you, if, you'd, been, if you'd have been at the camp with us Saturday night, you'd have seen, you'd have had your mind blown. Because it blew our mind what we seen. Right. We was hearing, we was hearing them right next. They was on our side of the creek behind that little bush, standing there. Growling, hunting, and raising cane as people cross the, cross the, uh, cross the, uh, right at the other camp. And you could, they were close up. You could hear them guttural. You could hear them breathing. That's what blew my yeah. cookie. You could, you could hear them breathing. That was wild, man. You know, well, you know, with all that being said and everything, um, first of all, um, I want you to tell us about your experiences and everything, but I, I want to, I want you to start off if you don't mind, uh, tell the listeners and everybody kind of, um, fill everybody in for those who may not know you, uh, tell us about what got you started, how long you've been involved and what led up to your, all your Bigfoot research. And, you know, kind of, if you want to take it, uh, take it from that there and then, um, uh, we'll let you get that started and then we'll go from there. <laughs> all right. My name is Fred Caney. I am the head of the Virginia Mountain Bigfoot Research Organization, uh, the Valley of the Giants, Inside the Appalachian Squatch, True Believers, you know, all the good stuff, you know. And I've been, what got me into it was in uh, 1976, my dad took us to the Wayne Theater to see the In Search of Bigfoot. After that, I never really thought about it. Until 81, I was living over in Highland County with my dad, and we went to uh, Stanton one day, about four wheeler, you know. We come back, you know, and dad and his buddies were fiddling out with us, so I decided to go squirrel hunting. Well, I was walking up Jack Mountain at the base of it, going, getting ready to go up that, that mountain, uh, that logging road, and I stopped with a cigarette and was standing there looking at dad and him playing with a four wheeler. When I finished, I turned around, and about five feet in front of me was a nine foot bipedal. And oh, I'm going to tell you, I was scared, but my feet could not move. So I looked at it dead in the eyes, and it looked at me dead in the eyes. I looked from his head down to his feet, and I went back up, and he did the same thing. And I turned my head, and first thing across my mind was, this guy's going to rip me to threads. About, 10, 10, about 30 seconds later, I turned my head back. He didn't turn and walked away. He went over toward the seldom scene side of the, of the hunt club area. He went in that. He went through there, and that's what got me started, you know. But I really didn't see any more until '85, '86 over in Candy Fields. We was, no, I mean, of course, I riding around one night, you know. And we went up at the time. You could drive up into Candy Fields. We went up there, you know, in little Honda Civic or Toyota or something like that. We went riding around, went around the backside, come out, and I got hooked on a a, uh, a drain pipe. So we got stuck. So about 1 o'clock in the morning, I seen a buddy of mine, or well, seen somebody traveling through there, so I flagged him down. There's a buddy of mine. We, I asked him to pull me out, so he said, okay, so he pulled up behind us, I mean, in front of us, back in, hooked up. We just got the, you know, lights and everything. We just sat there and was talking, you know. And over to our left, where, where the road was, there's like a little patch of woods there, you know. We heard rocks or wood started being thrown at us. We're like, what is going on? Then we heard what they call a banshee scream. I mean, it was a shrill. And it scared the living crap out of us, man. Then we heard about, that went for about five minutes, and we were like, what in, you know, I mean, of course we were cussing and everything, like, what the hell's going on, you know, da 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 that, you know. And then we heard something go boom, 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 and I told the girl, I said, hit the headlights. When she did, it was an eight-foot brownish female bipedal. 
running. And she was not wasting any time, you know. So I'm like, okay. They got me started. And we called a game. We called Jerry Dove the next day at the game board. He came up there and said it was a bear. I said, no, because they put up on a locust tree. It snapped. I said, a bear cannot snap a tree. He's got to have a thumb to snap it the way it snapped, you know. He said uh, it could be an elk, it could be a moose. You know, he just, he didn't believe me, period. Then we showed him the footprints, and he's like, well, I don't know what to tell you about that, and that's all he said about it. Well, I found out later on, like this past summer, that Game Commission does not, Virginia Game Commission does not recognize Bigfoot because of the tourists. They find out that the tourism find out that Bigfoots are here, they're not going to come, so they do not acknowledge Bigfoot. That's what the Game Commission says in Virginia. But you know, I you know, I started, you know, you know, uh, really hitting that area hard, you know, uh hunting, you know, and trail hiking and all that crap, you know, I started noticing more and more and more, you know. And I started noticing structures, you know, and when I first got into it, I mean, I was putting everything out there that I seen and everybody said, Oh, it's nature, blah blah, you know, you hear you know, you got your groups that, you know, Danny, you know this too, get in certain groups and they just they, they just use you for a mop rag, you know, and make fun of you, you know. So I said, Hell oh, yeah. You know, so I, yeah, so I said, forget all that group, you know, and I started uh, Valley Bigfoot. And um, and from that time on, you know, I started going in. The more I went in, the more I started, you know, paying attention, you because know, I, I did science for five years, you know, and technically seven years after I got out of high school, I was, I got a degree in science as far as DNA goes, you know. No one knows that because I, I went to, you know, I, t- I took a seven-year course at uh, Blue Ridge College on that, you know, when no one knew about it. And so, you know, I did that, you know, and I could, and I ran into a dead end when I was researching everything. So I decided, well, let me go to the Native Americans. So I started going to them, you know, and I was talking to a lot of Natives, you know, and they started giving me hints and stuff. And then when I started paying attention to what I was, what was around me, like the sound of deer, the sound of birds, you know, every animal out there has a particular note that one person or another cannot make. You can only, like, a crow call. You can go by a crow call. Some people can make it by mouth. But if you take a stick, cut it down the middle, and you put a piece of crab grass or green grass and you can and blow on it and it sounds like exactly like a crow you know but a squatch can imitate a crow but they cannot imitate a dove because there's a particular note a dove makes and the way they do it a squatch cannot do it they've i've heard them imitate in your area daniel me and you one night heard a barred owl then we kept hearing something imitated two more times behind it and I think it did for like five minutes or something like that. We thought it was a barred out, then we started hearing that echo behind it. We're like, hey, man, there's two squatches right there, you know, because they were imitating the uh, the barred out. Now, I oh, have yeah. heard the last day of Spring Gobble of last year, I get there the last day, it's about an hour before daylight, you know, in about maybe 15 minutes before daylight, I hear something come from right there at that parking lot of Kennedy Fields come from the right, shot a car, probably about, probably about 100 yards down the road. I heard something come burrow through the woods, and when it crossed the road, I heard a hawk, a chicken hawk. I heard a turkey, and I heard a crow at the exact same time. So there was three squatches making them sounds because right there at, right when you cross the road, there's no nest for a crow or turkey or uh, an uh, owl. Know, whatever. Yeah. yeah, an owl, you know, and, you know, stuff like that, you know. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's right there at your road. But you can hear them going up, up, you know, you can hear them moving up to the woods. You know, I really didn't know what it was at first, you know. I'm like, okay, something right here, you know, because the only time you really hear a bald owl is in the late evenings or at the at, uh, by like right before daylight is when I usually hear a barred owl, and it's right. very rare. It's very rare that I hear one. Turkeys, very very rare do I even hear a turkey, a tom, you know, and stuff like that. You know, but it's 
you know, I started paying attention. Then I started noticing structures, you know. Then I started going back to Indian glyphs, you know, and I started noticing things. Then I started taking the glyphs, the, the structures that I got, take pictures of them, going back to the native glyphs and matching them up, and it gives you a word. Then you start research. In other words, instead of you doing the scientific way, it's like an archaeology. you got to find the evidence and go back in time and then come forward. And that's when I really started to learn then I started paying attention to when I went into the woods. I started noticing the sounds that I was listening to, like during the summertime compared to during the wintertime. You know, there's a big difference in there, you know. But people don't really realize that. They think when you go in, you know, you only listen to one thing. If you pay attention to everything, oh, yeah. you, will, you will notice what's going on in there, you know. You will notice what's a squatch and what's not a squatch. You know, when you walk in the woods, you know, you walk in here, all of a sudden you hear a little tap, tap to your left, and all of a sudden you hear a tap, tap to your right. First thing across your mind is, that's a woodpecker, a couple of woodpeckers, you know. And you go up further and you hear the same thing. You're like, are they following me? You know, there might be a bunch of woodpeckers in here. Then you realize that the knocks or the taps are actually knocks by chubies or a Sasquatch communicating back and forth, letting them know where you're at. And people don't realize that, you know. But here's what some most people don't realize. When you hear them like that, what they're doing is giving their location away. You know there's one back here behind you. You know there's one in front of you. But how many of them are there? You know there's two, but how many more do you, of, of, do you know it's any, uh, how should I say, how many more do you think it's in there, you know? And yeah, even um, to, I wanted, well, yeah, I want to interrupt you uh, real quick. Cause do you remember that one time? It was me, you, and that girl. We were hiking up across, uh, you know, over in my area, and we came up on that one ridge. And and we kind of rested for a little bit, and I decided to do a yeah, tree well, knock. Yeah, we had we had something between us. Yeah, apparently there was a couple of them that we were either being watched or followed. Because after I gave well, my tree found- knock, you know, we we had two responses: one to the left, and then one uh, then after that one tree knock a uh, knock somewhere way further yeah. up on the right, up on that ridge, knocked again. Yeah. Yeah, because when we come down, we all stop the area to take a rest, and you just happen to look down. You almost stepped in a perfect footprint. Yeah. It was, I think, a 14-inch print. And you know, you just step in, and we all look down like, oh, my God, there's a back there, you know. That was yeah. phenomenal, man. But there was something between us. Yeah, most definitely. Something something yeah. was definitely following us in that area. Now, I want to back up real quick, too, because, you know, you, you were talking about the owl limitation. And I, I know a lot of us have talked about this in the past. Well, I can recall back this past hunting season uh, when me and Brianna, uh, we, we camped out for a few days uh, during the hunting yeah. season. And uh, it was probably, I want to say, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, <clears throat> you know, it was just getting dark at that time. It's starting to get dark. But right across from camp where we always camp, up on the hill there, you know, over there on that ridge where, where me and you heard – uh, what sounded like what we thought was a uh, barred aisle. Yeah, somewhere up. On the, I know there was nobody up there because, but the vocalization that we heard that night, I said I told Brianna, "Do you hear that?" She, she's like, "Yeah." I said, "It almost sounds like an owl." But I can, she, I told her, I said, "That's not no owl." It would. I, I'm gonna try to imitate it the best way I can. The way I heard it, it was like. Oh, 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 but it, it had that deep tone. Oh, yeah, oh, oh. yeah. like I, it was I, like way out of tone. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now I tell you, this past summer, it was an hour before your dad got there. I walked up there, you know, where me and him, you know, where we usually sit long in there. Right. We went in there. I went in there and sat. I was about maybe ten feet between each guy. And right behind us on that ridge, on that same ridge, I heard, I told oh, wow. I said, what? I said, man, that's a squash. No, there's someone back on the ridge. I said, there's no one up there. And if you'd listen to how loud it was, that was no human. It blew a lot of people's mind. And they, I said, that's a squash. I mean, this was like... 11.30 in the morning, 
And he, I oh, mean, wow. that guy rocked that. He rocked that hollow, Michael Bernard. I mean, just as clear and crystal clear as you can get. He rocked. And everybody mm. was, it was, everybody stood along that side there just stopping and looked back on that ridge. Just they turned and looked back the same way, and I did too. That was a mm. loud yell. So you got wow. to there's, there's some there's some big ones in there coming out of West Virginia. There's some massive ones coming out of West Virginia. I believe that. I could uh, I could yeah. really believe that. Um, yeah, but ladies and gentlemen, I, but, okay. Yeah, I, no, I just want to remind everybody real quick. Um, we do have a call in number. If you have questions that you want to ask our guest, the call in number is six five seven three eight three one seven one three. Um and uh, real quick at any time, Baltimore uh, I Baltimore is live with us and uh we do have Zach with us. Um at any time if you have any questions for our guests, please feel free to ask. Um do either one of you have a question for Fred before we before he continues? <laughs> oh, I think you're... Nice. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'm I'm too busy listening to the woods right now. I'm at base camp right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Let me give you a little tidbit here. And I'm going to ask Baltimore and I'm going to ask Zach and I'm going to ask you, Tanya. All right. I've seen a big one in my area back in the summertime. What is the average height of the ones in your area, Zach? Uh, th- this area is new for me. I'm in the northern part of Jackson County, up okay. by Perry County, Illinois, about, uh, pretty much on the county line running along Interstate 51. And, uh, I mean, this place, from what I understand, has got uh, Bigfoot that go anywhere from 8 to 10 foot tall, and they've been frequenting this area for about nearly 80 years, if, give or take. Cool. Yeah. All right. Baltimore. Yes, Down sir. Down there in Texas. Down there in Texas. Yep. So I think you're you're in what? East Texas. South Texas. South Texas. And, All right. What yeah, is the uh, what is the average height for the ones in your area that you've heard about or possibly caught glimpses of? Okay. The the one that I saw was I would say pretty close to like eight feet or nine feet tall. And that's the one that I saw. And then so other people descri- uh, here, another eyewitness actually des- uh, described it as the tall as a as a, a, tri- a tree limb. And um, and uh, there there's actually been a few of those that has been reported like that. Uh, they have actually like in the Mathis area, Mathis, Texas area. Uh, there has actually uh, a, uh, a guy actually saw it, and uh, he said that, that there was no taller than five feet. Uh, we have all different kinds of sizes out here. Uh, height-wise, I, I can't give you what the tallest, but uh, I, I can let you know what I've seen between eight and nine. And other people have actually seen it, like pretty close to nine. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, like down here, you know, uh, you know, uh, I have, uh, you know, we never thought that Bigfoot would ever be here in South Texas. You know, no, you know, I would think about it up north, up the Appalach- Appalachian Trails, and uh, up in the right. D.C. area. You know, and uh, and uh, never has anybody ever thought, you know, that uh, Bigfoot would here in South Texas. You know, there's even stories, even in Mexico, that they see them down there. I mean, there's yeah. a, there's a, you know, there's a bunch of stories. Really, Bigfoot is in every single state in the United States, everywhere in North America and South America. You know. Uh, you know, I've always said, you know, there's some times when, uh, when you actually find a Bigfoot or actually see one for yourself, it's, it's like winning a lottery ticket. You know, it, you know, people yeah. just have, you know, just just uh, being there at the right time. Uh, you yeah. know, there was actually there was actually some oil field workers uh, here, like around this was seven years ago. Uh, actually, saw uh, one actually using a stick as a digging tool. And these and these was oil field workers, and they actually got a pair of binoculars, and actually started sharing, and, and was going, "Hey guys, look at this! What do you think this is?" 
And uh, and they're like, oh man, he goes, this is the most famous monkey man. That's what they actually called it. Uh, oh. And, uh, and uh, yeah, in that area. I mean, we got a lot of different names down here. So. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, here here on the East Coast, the biggest one I we've seen was a twenty footer. And we found out that the only time you ever see something that big is when they come down off the mountain because and search for food. Now, what me and Connie saw uh, a couple nights before we left the camp last year was a once-in-a-lifetime. We, we had a phenomenon happen, you know. And I mean, we're still baffled about it, you know. I, and I'm still talking to other Native tribes about it, you know. And they're telling me that what we've seen was a once in a lifetime thing. You know, and but the average that I see that I've found we found uh back earlier this year we found a twenty four inch footprint and I, I we looked all around and where I found the other I found it says left foot we found and I found the right foot and we took a tape measure and measured the uh big toe from the big toe of the left foot to the heel of the right foot, and it was 11 foot stride. So if it's 11 foot stride, what's the height of that? I'm kind of, you know, I'm guessing about. Fred, yes, I have a question to ask you, and um, and I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful to you or anything like that, um, but um, uh, it's I mean it's pretty hard uh, to uh, figure out something that. Big as a twenty uh, twenty footer. Uh, well, how uh, uh, can you give me uh, when you saw it and uh, and uh, what the day was or the night was when you actually saw it and determined that it was a twenty footer? Okay, out in front of the, from where we sat, where I have the squash is coming across the road. The road is exactly probably say what about what uh, about thirty yards? You say, Daniel. Yeah, give or take. Yeah, I say that. Okay. Yeah. All right. When the squatches are walking down the road, their eyes are they're, they're they're blinking white. Their eyes are white. Now people don't realize it, but when you look at a squatch in the face when his eyes are white, and they're close enough, you see a black line go from one side to the out to the other through the center. And when you're when they're walking, they're blinking. Now remember, a lightning bug flies radically and they're little 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 teeny but when you see eyeballs as big as silver dollars walking down the road looking at you and what the not the next day we went out to that spot where that squat where, where I first saw him I took the tape where his head was we measured twenty feet with a tape measure. Now I can't tell you if that's the one with the uh, 24-inch track, but that's the biggest track I've found in my area ever. I've seen 15, 16, 17-inch, 18-inch tracks, but I have, this was the first 24-inch track that had a an 11 foot track. Because one night, I went to the car to get something, and, you know, we had squatches, you know, across the road, you know, on up there between the our camp in the field or next to the other camp. And when I was coming back, I seen, I, I told Connie, I said, there's a squash swinging through the trees. It was about 18 foot high. And I said, well, he's swinging through the trees. And I noticed that his eyes were staying level because he was looking at me. I'm like, he ain't swinging. He's walking. That was the 18 footer that we first seen. That was Henry. And then we seen another one on the other side of camp, the left side of camp. So we named him John, and both of them are 18. And we figured out what well, we got. We got family units in my area because of the birthing areas. And what they are, they are guards. They come in and they stand at one, posi- one particular spot until all the other squatches are across the road. Then they go on up, up on the mountain, and they do their hunting and everything. Then about five, about four, anywhere between 4.30 and 5 o'clock, maybe 6 o'clock, they come back through and go across the road back to their nesting area. You know, because we, we, for two years we've been at that camp, and every year we watch them at certain times 
we know which where they're going to cross at and what time they're going to do that, and we watch them. Now, now last year we had Chad Detman there. I told Chad, I said, look about 10 feet in front of you at that berm. He said, what? I said, you got four eyeballs. Oh, that's lightning bugs. I said, since when lightning bugs have eyeballs as big as silver dollars blinking at you, looking at you? And then he realized that he wasn't looking at lightning bugs. He was looking at two juvenile squatches. Because where they cross at is where I parked my Jeep. And we watched them climb trees and everything. You know, but, but they're going, they're working their way behind the camp toward a meeting spot behind the camp somewhere, which I don't know. But when all of them get across, the 18 footers disappear. They go on back there and you don't see them anymore. Last year, we had an hour and a half to two hour window. This year, from just from what we've seen from that weekend, a couple, uh, a couple last week or so ago, there was a three and a half to a four hour window that we watched. It started about 9.30, quarter to 10. And it lasted to about, let's see, uh, 11, let's see, 10, 11, 12, 1. About, to about, 1, about 1, 1, 30 in the morning, and they was all gone. You know, and that's why I tell people, you know, you want to see these guys come to the camp. You know, because I'm, you know, because when we first got there, we didn't know what we were looking at. You know, we kind of, you know, kind of blew our cookies, you know. Then we started noticing my car being touched. I got handprints. I got cast. Uh, we got footprints all over the place, you know. I mean, I, I sent one handprint to M.K. Davis, and he he cleared it up. And you could see the dermal ridges in the whole hand. And I got a photograph. And we're going to have that at the conference. You know, we're going to have all our most the best photos we got and the casting guy. But I got a handprint from the middle of the hand down to the base of it where the, ain't, where the uh, wrist is. That's eight and a half inches long, wide. And that's and you could see every dermal ridge in that in those in that big hand and that small hand. We've had them stand on. We've had UV stand on my car. You know, crossing the road. I mean, they come across the road and they play. We just sit there and watch them. You know, and yeah, I admit there are some nights we don't see hiding no hair of them. You know, but on a good night, we'll see them. We'll see them come out of come out of one area, cross the creek. They'll run it back across the creek. They'll come through that little uh, uh, tunnel, goes under the road where the creek runs down. They come through there. They run out in front of the camp. They're, they cross the road, they're to the left of us, they're to the right of us, they're behind us, you know. And we always see white eyes, yellow eyes, yellowish green, I mean yellowish orange, green eyes. And what we seen just past last week when we were there, we seen red eyes. We had one, maybe two squatches right next to the camp on our side of the creek growling and throwing rocks across the road, and you could hear them breathing. That blew our mind. We've never had that ever happen before. That was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Here, here one stand right next to us within 30, 20 feet, growling across the road. They would look at it. You could see him. He turned his head, look at us, his eyes would be white. But when he turned his head, looks across the road, his eyes were red. And we've never seen that before. We've never seen them get that aggravated. But the guys across the road, there were three guys, they had flashlights, and they were shining them up in the trees all over the about maybe an hour, you know, and then they finally left, and when they did, everything settled down. It blew our, I mean, it blew our cookie, you know. But we tell people, if you want to see them, just come to the camp and just sit there and watch. You will have your mind blow because every time, we're at that camp. I learned something new about the about the squatches. I learned how they. I've learned how the juveniles belly crawl. I've watched them. We learn. We see them climb trees. We watch them. We had one across the road climb 45 feet up into a top of pine. He was a lookout guy, and his eyes were green or green and then turned yellowish. But when he turned his head and his face in our way, it lit his whole face up. And you could see that he had no hair on his face. You know, they do stuff like that, you know. But they but they know that we, me and Connie are not a threat. So, yeah, 
they keep their house on us, but they go about their business. So all we do is just sit there. You know, we tell people, you want to see them come to the camp, just sit there and watch. Like we, like Kumbo and Bear from the out, Bigfoot Outlaws. Kumbo is all about going out with cameras and chasing Sasquatches, try to catch one running or catch one up close. Well, Bear is a member of one of is one is member of one of Connie's uh, Bigfoot groups, and he's been listening to my tidbit videos about going out in the woods to a big research area, making up a get get four guys set them at twelve, three, six, and nine around the fire, and just sit there, roast marshmallows, eat beans, you know, you know, whatever you want to do, you know, and just sit there, and he learned that. He went from chasing them to sitting there at the camp at his little spot and watching the squatches come in on him, and he started to learn. Now he he would rather sit at a, at, a, at his research area and sit there and let the squatches come to him. You don't have to go out and chase them or look for them if you know where they're if you know where they're going to be at. Just be there, have your little fire, and everybody, like I say, 12, 3, 6, and 9, that way everybody's watching everybody's back. Watch her, because it's it's common sense to a point that Sasquatches are the only creatures that I know of that can draw light from pitch black darkness and, and have white, yellow, yellowish orange, Green and red eye shine due to the mood. But the difference is, when you look at a deer, you see a kind of a starry, a glare-like look. But when you look at a squatch's eyes, you're looking at two perfectly round marbles. And people don't realize that. You know, they say, oh, it's a bear. Nah. If you take a flashlight and you hit a bear or a red fox in the eye with a flashlight, I think the I think the bear's eyes and the red fox's eyes are red. I'm not really sure. Yeah. But you got yeah. Hit, but, yeah. But you got to hit them with a flashlight to make their eyes reflect light. They can only draw X amount of light, just enough for them to see a little bit. But a squatch draws light from pitch black darkness. There's something about their eyes I don't know. Maybe that black line across the eye has something to do with that. I don't know. But Every one I've seen out in the woods at nighttime is two perfectly round marbles, and they blink at you. And I'm still learning about these creatures doing that, you know, because, yeah, I've been doing this for quite a few years, but every time I go in the woods, I learn something different every day. You hear people on the line saying, oh, we're talking to Bigfoot experts. There are no Bigfoot experts. There are only serious opinions. And me, yep. everybody on the panel here, we're we're talking, we're we're speaking theories and opinions on what on what we see and what we see interaction. Like Daniel, you had that rock thrown at you that one day over at my area. You and that yeah. girl saw that one stand on the side of the hill going down the main back path there, you know, one stand there looking at you. I think you got a picture of it. Yeah, no, there's a. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was actually yeah, it was, it was kind of a slight rainy day. It was it was light yeah, rain that exactly. day. I was. Yeah, I think it's on one of my yeah. videos called "Squatching in the Rain." Yeah, and plus you got two juveniles that you jumped. You jumped and they jumped in the bushes, and you got their you got the fluorescent glow of their eyes. See, people think, oh, they got white in their eyes. They don't have no white in their eyes. Their eyes are fluorescent. When you, I said, I yeah. Yeah, this guy I, I got a hold of me. Yeah, no, Brianna's ahead. the one that saw them. Yeah, because uh, we were sitting around the campfire, and that's when I called you because I told you what we were uh, what we here. No, you had told us, you had told me to have Brianna give off uh, a vocalization. And yeah. after that, that's when we started getting activity because right uh-huh. there behind, right behind camp, from where we were camping, all it sounded like was going, you could hear, like, it started like, it started off as like walking, then all of a sudden it was like running back and forth. And it was like, yeah. like feet, you could hear the feet, the pads of the feet 
like just run on the yep. flat ground, push it back and forth. Yep. And at yeah, one point, that's where Brianna said she saw like a yellowish orange glow, um, yeah. like eye shine. Yeah. I was sitting at the wrong angle because I, as soon as she saw it, I got up and got into her position. By the time I was there, I couldn't see nothing. But she swore yeah. up and yeah, down. That's what she saw. Yeah, because there was, uh, I think there was, I think there were two stands in there, wasn't it? One or two. I, I believe it had to be at least two because I mean we saw. The, the sound yeah, of those what were we the heard brothers. running, it had been at least two, yeah. Yeah, those were the brothers. Those were the two brothers I was telling you about. Because I said that's yeah. where they come right behind the camper, so she got a good look at them. But, they, but believe it or not, they respond to a woman faster, and they would show themselves to a woman before they showed themselves to a male. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, real quick, we're, we're about to go take a, about a two-minute break real quick, but there was one particular area I used to go into all the time in my area um, is not, not the area close to camp, but uh, it was a certain area I used to walk into and I used to find different signs and interesting stuff. But the one day I decided I, I had Brianna with me and I brought her in here this one particular time. It sounded like walking into a zoo, into the uh, primate exhibit. You hear howls, whoops, all kinds of crazy sound. It sounded like everything just started going off. And it sound, some of it sounded fairly close. Some of it was distant, but it was just on top of over the ridge from, uh, yeah. from, you know, above where we were. And it just having her with us is like, it turned everything on. I was like, man, I never experienced this when I'm in here by myself, you know? So, exactly. yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. Because when I get Connie with me, that's when we get all the experience. You know, that's when we like, when we was up there, they, me, you and her, you know, and well, I took her up for a couple of days before and she saw that squatch. And every time I looked toward it, he would duck back. But I turned my head, he would pop out, and that's what we call Fabio. You know, and that's the same area that you got that video of that juvenile. You know, but every time, every time I take Connie somewhere, I took her up the road here, uh, back and by about a month ago, and she bit, she took a picture, and we looked at it, and she had actually caught a little female Sasquatch, a little round face. Mm. About an hour away, we come walking out of, there, out of that area, and and she heard "ia" from a little girl, squatch. Or it, well, it had to be a squatch, you know, because there was no one up there but us, you know. And she heard it, and it, she said it was like a little girl, and it was that little squatch. And she said, "It says, I'm your friend in Cherokee." It said "ia." I'm like, wow, you know. But I don't, yeah, I don't ever get that. I get growled at, you know. But uh, yeah. there's something about a there's something about a woman and a girl that that a squatch will respond to, and I can't oh, yeah. figure it out. I'm still figuring yeah. that out. Well, Fred, uh, real quick, we're gonna take a yeah about a two minute break, and um, you know if you have anyone that needs to use the bathroom, grab a drink. Uh, go ahead and take care of that. And when we get back, we're gonna continue this conversation. And uh, yeah, I had, and I had a question or two lined up uh, regarding. Uh, Bigfoot groups and clans. So we'll talk about that when we get back. So, um, so yeah. So from here on out, here's about a two minute break, and we'll be back with Squash Your Own Radio.
welcome back to Squash Your Own Radio. We are back. We are live. We go roughly one more hour left here on the show, and we are speaking with Mr. Fred Kenny here in Virginia, the uh, Shenandoah Valley. And uh, make sure we got Zach. You still with us? Zach, I see his phone. His phone line still up. Okay, I don't know what Zach is, but I know we lost Baltimore. His phone, his phone was dying, so he had to go charge it up or something. So, but Zach, I don't know where you're at. I know you're still on the line. You're probably muted or something. We got us muted. <laughs> anyway, Fred, you're still there, right? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, cool. Well, one of the other questions I wanted to uh, ask you because you know you were talking about. I know in your particular area you have uh, groups or family units, um, as you know, I guess uh, more or less classified as more like clans. Well, yeah. and I agree with that. I believe, I personally believe that uh, a majority of them, the population, the way the population is, wherever how it may be spread out throughout the state, I, I do believe they are broke up in groups of clans. Maybe not all. Maybe not that that may not be the case everywhere. Um, you know, I'm sure you got some Lone Rangers as well, I don't know, I didn't know how else to put it, but you know, <laughs> just, you know, you, some that act alone, but uh, yeah. It, uh, in your in your uh what's your take on that? How, now, do you believe that a lot of them do act together in groups or clans? Yeah, from what we've noticed over the past year, a uh, couple of years, you know, we've noticed we've seen um uh, juveniles seen seen We've seen May, but we do. I know one clan, the first clan that I've seen, we have like six in it. We trains from the daddy down to maybe a day watcher or so, you know, like that. But I know, I'm just taking an educated guess here. I'm guessing when they give birth, they give birth just like we do, as far as maybe one, maybe two, maybe if they're lucky, they might have triplets, you know. It's, you know, it's, all, you know, it's just like a human, you know. When they give birth, you know. So, but we, but right now we have a boatload of juveniles that that uh, uh, we can have going. We camped out. I know we counted at least thirteen to fourteen juveniles that was under four foot tall, you know, running around, you know. So, yeah, I mean, you know, they're clans, you know, uh, family units, more or less. That's what we call them, family units. Yeah. But, you know. We see the big males, we see the females with the juveniles, and we see the juveniles running around and everything. And we also seen two females carrying their young. So, and the young, you know, kind of like clamp on, you know, they hold them, but sometimes they clamp onto them like glue, you know, like on their back or something like that, you know. Oh, and yeah. And they carry them, stuff like that. It's pretty wild. But you guys think, look how strong these guys are, you know. Yeah, cause, you know, I wonder. I wonder if the groups of clans that I'm. I mean, well, I'm sure they vary in size. As far as like, for example, um, the encounter that six of us encountered back in 2014, there were three of them, yeah. and we believe one was the male, one was a female, and one was definitely a juvenile. And right. So, I I believe I personally believe that that was a family, or just a, you know a free group family. Now, yeah. maybe there's other bigger groups elsewhere, but, you know, so that's what I'm saying. I, I think there's a variation with groups and clans and, you know, where they may dwell, you know? Yeah. It's, now, I, I remember uh, I watched a video from a guy uh, in the early, 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 like 1970, 71, somewhere in that area. It's somewhere over, over out in the Rockies. I don't know, things like Colorado. He was a, uh, a survivalist, you know, and he, he would go out and he would spend time in the mountains, you know, up in the Rockies and everything. And he, he videoed a male, a big male, a female, and a juvenile come up this ridge, and the male went over to this rock pile and was moving boulders big as a Volkswagen, and he moved enough, enough of them, and he found a mouse and he ate it. So that's it. and what his opinion was maybe the uh the male fence for himself so 
that leaves the female to teach the young one how to survive as far as foraging, what to eat, what not to eat, and stuff like that. Now, is it the same now? I don't know. But I am still learning that, you know. But from what the video he showed, because he went up and stood in that hole about two hours later, and he went, now, when the squash got that mouse, it was up to his waist. That's how far he dug down in the rocks. But when he went up there and stood it, it was up to his, right, right at the base of his uh, chin. It's how far, the uh, how deep the hole was that he went to get that mouse. But the thing was, look how strong that squatch was moving boulders away much as a Volkswagen. You know? Yeah. And the other we got question, a question is... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I, no, I was going to mention but, that we have a qu- uh, question from a listener. Uh, oh, okay, and this comes... From, this comes from Miss Rose Dickens. Uh, she's listening in through Facebook, and uh, she goes on to say, "She said, why do you uh, why do you think with all the technology we have, uh, or the why do you think with all the technology we have, the best pics that I've seen of Bigfoot are very old. We have infrared now and faster speed digital, but everything looks blurry in recent shots I've seen. And I guess she's referring to you know." everything that floats around social media in general. Uh, you want to yeah. go ahead and take a whack well, at that? Yeah. thing is, these creatures are so freaking fast. But here's the thing. They, their hearing, think about the buffalo. They can't see what's up far, but they can hear a pin drop at 300 yards. Mm. And they smell. Yeah. And they smell. So think about this. You could take a $5,000 camera and have a squatch stand there, but the minute you push down that button, he's gone. Now, that is one thing that no one can explain. I can't explain it. You know, game cameras. Some people get lucky, like Ryan Reddy, and he had his game camera or camera on and he, in New York, and he caught that squatch walking from left to right. All right? Scott Carpenter had one licking his camera. He had that camera set at nine feet high, and that squatch had to duck down to lick that camera because they had it in a metal box, you know, like that, you know. But those are those are stationary cameras. But when it comes to a photograph camera, they can, I'm guessing, they can hear that mechanism and bolt. That's the only thing I can think of because... All right, squash washers in Carolina. Look at the equipment they got. How, have they yet caught a squash and got a clear picture? No, it has. M.K. Davis, I mean, uh, Gilman and Pat Patterson and Gimlin, the only reason they got that photograph, that video and that photograph of their squash was because the day before there was a lot of squashes eradicated. No one knows it, but Patty's right leg where that tumor comes out is a bullet wound. She was shot in the back of the leg going forward. And M.K. Davis cleared it up enough. He just showed it not too long ago that <laughs> excuse me, around Patty's back waist was a juvenile arm. You could see the fingers clamping into the fur, that's where it looked wrinkled at. People thought it was a people thought it was a cop. Because it was a juvenile Sasquatch. That's why she was protecting the left. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, uh please bear with us. Uh we actually just lost Fred. Um so we just lost Fred. Fred will be back with us. His connection had dropped. Um so uh, right now, until he comes back on, I'm not sure what happened. Um, we'll, uh, Zach, are you live with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Uh, I don't know until we get Fred back. Uh, that, that's some information I'm curious to know where he got that from uh, regarding the Patterson footage. Are you familiar with what, what he might be talking about? 
I mean, I know I've read about where uh, David, where M.K. Davis went and showed the thing about uh, the blood and the master. where the difference. Huh? Yeah, because I remember there was uh, something that M.K. showed something to do with the blood and massacre and all that. So I'm not familiar. Well, with, he was I mean, talking I don't about. Know. I'm talking about where he showed the video of where the sw- motion of the arms swinging changed. After she oh, went past that tree. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and we got Fred back with us, so he could continue that discussion. Uh, Fred, you're back with us. Sorry you lost your call. Yeah, uh, what people don't realize is that when Patty was walking that, when Zach was actually talking about that arm swing, if you watch the left arm, it looked like she was holding something. But if you notice... When she went behind a tree, she disappeared for a second. When she come out, she was right directly in line with Patterson, and she bent over. That she went down to all fours. And when she bent down to all fours, you seen all the female junk. In 1967, Hollywood admits we did not have the technology to make outfits like that. You know, but she had a baby on it because MK cleared it up enough you could see a little hand and an arm wrapped around the back her back waist. Yeah. And they were and using a fifteen mean, millimeter camera back then too. That was okay. uh, actually pretty good pretty good footage for fifteen millimeter uh camera. And it was also a rental camera. They rented that camera. Oh um, yeah, okay. Yeah, he rented that camera. Yeah, that's what's the, so funny. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh-huh. But the whole time was they knew, they knew that they could get a picture of a Bigfoot because Patterson knew that logger. See, I got a video that's got a white German Shepherd in it, and it shows the white German Shepherd kind of like sniffing around a puddle. That yeah. puddle was blood. And right to the right of the dog, you see black hair. You clear it up, you see black hair. Those are the eradicated squashes. Because if the logger couldn't get them out of there, he would have had to shut that business down for that chunk of woods. He would have lost money. So he hired bounty hunters to come in. And that's the next day is when Patterson Gimlin showed up. Because the reason Patty looked made that turn and look like that because Patterson said keep an eye on her and Gimlin or somebody cocked a 30-30 she heard it she turned and looked right that's and that's when Patterson got that shot of Patty doing that Mm. there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of stuff people didn't know about that video you know because I pay uh, close attention uh MK has yeah. been doing that video for what decades or a couple of decades, or whatever. Ever since ever since it come out, I reckon, and he's been dissected every inch of that video. And the clearest picture is the one where he has he's at a conference and he's standing there. He's standing there next to a ten foot, I mean, a eight and a half to nine foot picture of a cleared patty. Now, if you take the hair off her face, you're looking at a Neanderthal. Sharon yeah. Hay made a video, uh, made took a picture, to, took the Patterson, uh, the, uh, the picture of the Patterson film of Patty, and took the hair off the face, and you have a Neanderthal. I've got two photographs of a Squatch that looks exactly like a Neanderthal. You know, there's a lot of variations to that video, you know, and Zach was talking about the arm swing. Yeah, some, I guess it's in the video, you know, but, you know, he's clearing up, you know, there is a little of something funny when she swings it forward and then comes back. And that's the funniest part of it. I don't know if I can remember if it's the left hand or the right hand, but I know the left hand had something in it. And if you look at the ground, her left side, she was kicking up sand while she was walking. So she had something heavy on her left side. And that's something that we never paid attention to. 
All we just saw was a picture of Patty walking. And that's what everybody was dissecting. They didn't they didn't pay attention to the other half of the video. You pay right. half you pay attention to the other half of the video, you will see what I'm talking about. Now I got that video with the white German Shepherd, I gotta find it, but I got it and I'll send it to you. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Because I copied it from his better yet, just go to MK Davis's YouTube channel with Patty on it and just right. scroll through it. You will come across that white German Shepherd. There's a, there's a, uh, there's two guys. One, one has the white German Shepherd on a leash, and the other guy is to the right of him, on the left side of the photograph or left side of the video, carrying a rifle. Yeah, I, I do recall seeing that footage. Uh, M.K. Davis actually had that on Facebook, um, not entirely too long ago. Uh, probably about a few months back or so, maybe a little longer than that. But. But I do, yeah. yeah, I do recall seeing that. So, yeah. hmm, pretty good. It's some interesting, you know. It's some interesting to you know to check into, you know. But you know, like I say, a lot of people, you know, like people say, but there ain't no such thing as eighteen or twenty footer. Just because you haven't seen one doesn't mean they exist. Right. A twenty footer, I never thought would exist, except for up in Canada. But on record. That I could find the biggest one was 28 and a half foot tall. That was in Canada. But here in the United States, especially here on the East Coast, I can understand it in in Washington State. But here, here in Virginia, that was the first for me. I, that was the first and only one I ever saw. The 18 footers, I see, I see, we see every night. But the 20 footer, that's that is a mind blower. Because we've never we never we never knew about it, but the, the Cherokees and all the in, other Indian nations have got stories, theories, legends, everything of these got creatures being up to twenty plus foot tall. And when I first started checking into, I thought it was just legends and theories. Then when you see one for the first time, your jaw hits the ground like a hundred miles an hour. You're like, oh. There actually do exist, <clears throat> and we saw that one. And I've talked to Sharon Day about it, and her th- theory is they come off the mountain for food, and even if they see a juvenile Sasquatch, they will kill it and eat it. That's why we had all them squatches up and all them juvies up in a tree. See, we're just now figuring everything out. You know, we've been talking to natives different natives all across the United States and Canada for the past four or five months. And we're finding out that they're telling us, each of them are telling us basically the same thing in one way or another about these, about these giants, you know, because technically what is the terminology for a giant Sasquatch? Does it go back to biblical time? Were they put here by Jesus or were they created by something and put here, or are they interbreeds from human to Neanderthal, maybe a gorilla, maybe a gigantopithecus? You know, what are they? What I see looks like a human. They have the same thing a male's got, and the females have got the breast, and the same thing a female's got. And they give birth the same way a human does. The only difference is when you find a birthing area, do not step in it. If you step in it, say like you go there, like you walk by there, you know, you get growled at it. You know there's a squatch in there. You come back the next day and there's not. No, you're going to be curious and go inside it. But what you don't know is that spot is the sanctuary for that for that female and that juvenile. And if you go in there and, and you're violating the sanctuary by going in there or yeah or stepping into it, the squatches are going to leave. They're going to they're going to leave the area completely because you violated her sanctuary. See, that's that's a lot of things people that's a lot of things people don't understand, you know, about these creatures. Thirty eight years, you know. I mean, I've learned a lot, you know, and I've learned. A day bed, yeah, I go into a day bed every time I go in there, you know, 
And sometimes I go through them and don't even know it, you know, because they make them so many different ways. They got so many different types of structures on how they, they got so many types of structures on how they build, like just take some sticks and put them together, you know, just enough to keep the sun from blaring down like in a patch, like in a pine thicket. They'll take, they'll take X amount of sticks and they'll make like a little, like a little roof shelter. And they'll lay underneath of it because it keeps the sun off of them. You know, it's like a shady spot, and a little, and it's like a little security blanket, you know, for their day bed or something like that. You know, that's you know that's yeah. something that I've learned. That's something I've learned about these creatures. You know, but I do know that if you step into a day bed, uh, step into a bird there, they're gone. Because I did, I made that mistake one time over in um, Highland County. I stepped into a bird's bed, and I was watching these. I mean, I was didn't see them, but I was finding evidence everywhere of them. and one day I stepped into the birthing area and after that I never seen another one since in that area. So, you know, that taught me a lesson, you know, and plus going through the natives, I was finding out more and more and more and more and more. And I'm still learning because you will never ever learn everything about these creatures. Right. That's the weird part. That's the weird part about it, you know, so what because what let's say one thing to have, let's say Baltimore sees one and throws a rock at him from across the lake or something, or across the creek. Then we go to Zach's area, and all of a sudden we have about five rocks from flying at us or a couple of pine cones. We go to your area, and we get we get yelled at. Because that yell I heard that day over was not a little one. That was a big one, you know. And we go into my area, and you'll have rocks thrown at the creek at you, you know. We got all these areas in different states in different areas, but yet they're doing the same. They basically do the same exact thing, if you think about it. Each squash was aggressive by showing you aggression. Like you're too, if you're too close, I've been I've got too close to a broken bed. I got whistled at. Then I got growled at by three of them. That's not fun, you know. So it teaches you, you know. And that's why, you know, I know a lot about these creatures because I pay attention and I observe. That's the main thing. When I go into woods, I pay attention to everything. And a good researcher will pay attention to everything. Sounds, oh, yeah. smell, the way the, creature, the way the animals walk. It, you can always tell when a squash is around with a deer. If you see one coming down a trail and all of a sudden he stops and he they look to the left, now, during the rut, so you think it's a buck. But if you watch the tail of that deer, she will let you know if there's danger or not. Because I watched two over in the Cold Springs area. I heard a squash coming through down the creek, and there were two deer down there. And I, well, I saw them and I watched them. And when that squash got within 30 yards, their tails stayed a half mass and they bolted for about maybe 40 yards and then that tails went straight up and back down to half mass. They never dropped their tails all the way. But I watched the deer's body movement and that told me that there was danger there. Listen to, watch, listen to crows. They're, they purposes for a squatch. They're the eyes for a squatch and, they're, and they aggravate the hell out of a squatch. You when I first started research down at Cold Springs, I knew the squash was around because the crows were going nuts. And they would always stay in that one particular area. And wherever the squash moved, the crows would move with it. And I learned that. You know, there's a lot of, you know, but there's a lot of things we need to, still need to learn, you know. But the family units, you know, yeah, they do have daddies, mamas, sons, daughters, and stuff like that, you know. But are they yeah. more? Are they more native? You know, far as the like, like, like the natives got witch doctors and shamans stuff like that. Do squatches have that? We don't know. We're still learning and everything, you know. Yeah, but, absolutely. And yeah, you know, I was just gonna say, just as you were saying that. Um, you know, as far as being aware of his surroundings, you know, anybody that goes out in the woods, regardless of what their business is for being out there, uh, you know, that's yeah. that's very important information that everybody should take regardless, you know. That way, exactly. if they are aware of their surroundings, they just might 
experience something that they're not expecting. Uh, of course, a lot of us, that's how uh, it's happened to, for a lot of us, right? You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, 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 look over at Elkhorn Lake, you know, that day I was over, 11 o'clock in the morning, and just, I know I know he had to be a big, at least 10 or 11 footer, but man, he rocked ass holler. Everybody at that lake turned and looked at that at that ridge. I mean, he rocked it. I've never heard one rock a ridge like that in that time of day. It was mm. still, it wasn't even 12 o'clock yet. It was like an hour before your dad got there. I mean, he rocked it. And I've never, mm. the only time I've heard something that loud was in Connie's area. We had a quarter mile away. See, Connie's, in Kentucky, Connie's family owned a old strip mine, which is like three miles in a square. And a quarter okay. mile away, we're sitting. In, we're sitting at her camp up in the pines, and we had we had four or five squashes watchers. You you could see them walking around. You see their eyes and everything, you know. And then we heard this big. Oh, I mean, it was so great that we felt it go through our bones. I mean, this sucker did it four times loud, and it rocked our bodies. But it was another. But five minutes later, they were in a squash within a hundred yards of us, hundred miles of us. They were all gone down toward him. But it's very rare you hear a squash do that. But that day, I think he was calling all the other squashes together because I mean he let out a roar that it sounded like I was standing fifty yards from him, and he let out the guttural of all gutturals. I mean he rocked that. He rocked that whole top of that ridge. If you go straight across your camp and go all the way up to the top of that ridge and halfway down and up the next ridge, he was standing right there. That's how loud he was. So that tells you how mm. big a big big of a set of lungs they have. You know, oh yeah. I guess, now I, guess, I have yet yeah, to hear a large, hear a large Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say I, I have yet to hear any kind of like really loud, heavy vocalization. I mean, I've had my share of vocalizations. Don't get me wrong, but as far as I would love to hear something guttural, but I don't know if I want to be too close to it. I'm like, <laughs> you know, well, I, I don't it, know. I don't I'll, know how I would handle that. <laughs> well, I put it this way: between what I heard at Connie's area and what I heard in your area, that's a big boy. That's a big boy. Because only mm-hmm. the dominant male will let out a yell like that to, to bring other squatches to him. And I mean, yeah. he rocked. His, his yell was about maybe 45 seconds apiece, nonstop. Girl. I mean, he was loud. Yeah. That right well, was really surprising. Well, let me tell you about one incident. You know, the encounter that we had back in 2014, you know, the tallest one, after, you know, from what we observed and, and did the daytime, uh, you know, height comparison, you know, trying to figure out yeah. how to match up what we were seeing, you know, that subject there we believe was average about at least eight foot. Now, another incident when I was by myself in those same patch of woods, not in the same area, but in the same general patch of woods, up across from camp when I was camping during a hunting season in 2015. Um, one of the experiences I had out there when I walked out to the road and started shining my spotlight in the woods, I had a deer. I didn't see the deer, but, you know, I know the sounds of the animals when they run and move. You know, so immediately to my left, I had a deer. I, I spooked a deer, and it took off. You could hear the sound of a deer, like, run off through the bush. And then as I pan my spotlight to my right, as soon as I reached probably, say, I'm I'm facing 12 o'clock, as soon as the spotlight got around, say, 2 o'clock, that's when I heard something very large and very heavy, just on, bipedal, step away from, you know, it didn't walk, it didn't run, but it, it wasn't a slow walk either. It was like a, every step it took, you could hear a thump and a crunch, like, and and it just the sound of it, like really built up, you know, in my chest, like wow, you know, it had me on edge. Where I'm here, ten o'clock at night, not, but a spotlight in my hand, you know, and then my shotgun was back at, you know, right behind me, back at the camp because you know I, I'm camping and this, you know it's it's hunting season, but you know, and so apparently I disturbed something 
And, you know, like I said, the sound of what I heard had been pretty large and heavy. Uh, you know, so there's no saying how big it was, but for it to make a thump and a crunch every time it stepped, you know, and almost to feel it, it's like, you know, the sound, the sound of it, it's like you're almost feeling that sound is so heavy, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it was a monster in there, apparently. Yeah. Well, I'll so. tell you, there's one thing I did learn about them. And take heed when I tell you this. If you showed any signs of fear, when you see him or hear him, they will use that to their advantage. They'll yeah. make a game at I learned that. And now when I yeah. see one, I just stand and look at him. Because... I don't care if they're 30 foot tall. If you take about five steps toward them, they're going to turn and walk away. They don't yeah. have nothing to do with us because we are the ones trespassing on their woods in, in their in their homes, you know. So, like the ones who come across the road at the camp, they're not really socializing with us. They're doing what they do naturally. They just cross the road and go hunting up on the mountain. We just happen to be in the right spot at the right time. That's the yeah. only difference. And we learn by watching all of them, watch the juveniles, watch the mamas and daddies, watching the two big ones stand there and guard, you know. You know, yeah, the guards are for protection. Yeah. You know, the juveniles you know, down the trees, they do this, you know, but they're all doing one thing. They're going hunting. They, I found out they do more hunting at nighttime and do more foraging and loafing during the day and everything. And that's when we, when we all get lucky and maybe catch one uh, sneaking around. We might catch one running up across a ridge, or we might hear one going <clears throat> unsuspectingly, you know. Or there's one thing, there's one thing I found out that they do make, and it the sound is very familiar to a hunter. A bear, you know, how a bear chatters his teeth when you're too close. Oh yeah. I've heard, yeah. I've heard squatches do that. Hmm. I had Ryan Ryan Redding found a video that I did back behind the camp one day, I mean, back behind Candy Fields one day, and I had videoed a, I guess it was an eight foot, maybe a nine foot, I don't know, but he was at least five foot from one side of his back to the other, and I heard, uh, you know, like a bird does a huff to let you know you're too close. If you don't do a teeth chatter, he does a huff. To let you know you're too grunt. close. Yeah, somebody yeah. will grunt. Yeah. Well, I heard that. And I'm like, mm, okay, is there a bear in the area, you know? And I knew there wasn't no bear around because when a bear smells you, you, can, you know when he's running because he, they do a three pattern. They do a three step pattern. And I didn't hear none of that. But Ryan, yeah. he showed me a video. I caught one sitting there with his back to me, and I never knew it. Apparently, I turned mm. the camera and faced that area. It was to my right, between the creek and the trail. I was right in that back area there. And I videoed him and didn't even know it. You know, but there's a lot of signs that they do, you know, that we don't know. And I'm still, I mean, I've heard bear. I mean, as far as the, the teeth chatter, the, uh, the huff like a bear. I've heard growls like a mountain lion. I've heard growls like a side come from a wolf, you know. How many different sounds do they make? Oh yeah. Uh Fred, we got a couple questions on the live chat for you. All right. Um first uh by user uh his, his name's Digger Dog. Are most of he's asking of most of your uh outings are they uh day or do you go out day or night? Well actually that's kind of both ain't it? Wait a minute, I'm losing you. Uh oh. Say that. I said, uh, say that. The question is: Are most of Fred's outings day or night? Most of um, more are at night to sit at the camp, but every once in a while we'll get lucky and see a juvenile follow us or something. One or two of them are like that, sneaking like up at the apple orchard. We get yeah. lucky and catch them every now and then, but it's not every day that we see them. And at nighttime. I mean, we might see them for like three nights in a row, and we might not see them for three or four days, you know. It just all depends on 
food source that I did learn. They follow yeah. deer. And I do know that there is a nest across the road. Where? I don't know. But I, that's where they, they come from, right back somewhere on the other side of that power line. They got a nest back there. I don't know where. I can't go back there because they got poster signs everywhere. Hey, I found tracks back there, back beyond the uh, yeah. power line before, down by the creek way down there. Yeah. Yep. So there is a nest down there because every every because every time we've seen them, they've come from that from that one spot. They come they come down. I do know they raid that old man's trap pond right there, where the creek feeds in to the, where the power line is. He's got a little pond there that he raises trap for his grandkids. And I do know the squashes come down through there and they raid his. I do know that much because I've got plenty of tracks all the way around the pond in, in the daytime. You know, mm. Then they come. Then they come toward us and cross the road right there, right behind where that swinging rope is. Right there, a little road goes up into woods or across from the camp. They come out right there and cross there, and they cross right there where my jeep is, and they cross right there where you usually park your van in that little pull-in area. They cross right in there all the way up from one side of the camp all the way up to the other side of that field. That's where they cross yeah. that. You know, the time. All right. Uh, the other question is is coming from uh, Bobcat Wong. Um, he said, "Ask Fred if he thinks Bigfoot shows itself when we are more depressed, like most people say they see a Bigfoot at bad times of life." This, I, I read that the way he said that. I'm a choking too. Um, <laughs> Bob is you you on the spot. Me, <laughs> He's yeah. messing with me. Oh, they will show themselves to a female before they will a male. Anything other than that, I don't know. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I think I know what he's asking. Uh, let me see if I can rephrase his question because uh, it, it is a little weird. Um, I, I guess there's some phenomenal certain things happen to people when they're uh, – you know, for example, some people believe that it's a blessing or a good thing that you see uh, see a Bigfoot to see one. I think it's a um, blessing. I think like it's a bad, blessing. like a bad omen kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's a blessing because yeah. you're 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 looking at a creature that very 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 few people ever get to see. It's like the right. rarest bird in the world, or the or the rarest uh, antelope or something like that. You know, something rare that people very rarely see. I think it's a blessing, you know, because if they was aggressive as as they are out west, we I'd, I'd carry a gun with me. But we've learned on the coast, you know, as they as you, you come out of Canada into Washington State, they're still aggressive. Then you come across the United States, and it gets smaller in size, but they get more docile and less aggressive. Now, why that is, I don't know. But I say it's a, I think it's a blessing to see one because you're looking at something that nobody hardly ever sees. And if you do see one, you're damn lucky. I will say yeah. that much. Now, I have yeah, hey, I Jamie, have heard... say something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Baltimore. I forgot you're back with us. I forgot about you. Because I'm staring at the live chat. I'm on a different window, a uh, different screen. So, yeah, go ahead, Baltimore. <laughs> yeah, everything depends upon what kind of people – live in certain areas. It's yeah. like for us down here, um uh, uh, a lot of the a lot of the uh Native American uh, population and a lot of Hispanic population, a lot of the Spanish population, you know, they all feel that it's a bad omen. Uh they, they believe that, you know, it's, it could be a possibility that uh, you know that witches or brujas actually uh, mate these creatures. And if you will yeah. actually talk about it, uh, if you it would if you would actually talk about it, or uh, or actually uh, uh, say that you actually saw one, uh, you know it would just bring you bad luck. And, yeah, Brenda uh, Harris. A, a lot of people. Yeah, Brenda and, uh, Harris. And, yeah, Brenda Harris says something about that because she's Native American and she uh she she says it's a bad omen. Or so yeah. many words. And like then. That. And then, and then come with other, and then they come with other people. You know, uh, a lot of people come up there and say, you know, that they know that they're out there, 
you know, there's a lot of people know that they're out there. You know, you know, I've, I've found three new names that they actually called it down here, and uh, they know that it's there. And they always knew, hey, uh, you know, uh, you know, they always told us, you know, don't go with their past dark. And uh, so, and then that's what, and uh, you know, until until I got older, then I realized, hey, this is this is what they were actually talking about. So, but but uh, but there's a lot of people said that that it was definitely a bad omen. So, you know, even even yeah. to this day, I mean, I mean, even to this day, nobody talks about it. You know, and, yeah. and uh, here 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 in the past few months, I I got real lucky. You know, people now started to talk about it, and uh, you know, the more that we talk about it, and the more that we could come up there and actually say, you know, as long as people don't realize and understand, you know, we're trying to. Uh, make people understand, you know, when they see this or hear about this, you know, that uh, or hear something that they indicate that they're not crazy or they're not a uh, uh, category as a drunk or, uh, uh, or, or a drug addict, you know. So that's one thing that we try to tell people, hey, you know what, you're not crazy. You know, a lot of people have experiences, you know, just, uh, just tell us what you saw or just tell us what you heard. So. Yeah. Yeah, as far as seeing one, you know, good or bad, I've heard I heard from both sides it could go I've heard it, it could be a good thing. Uh and I've heard very you know, I've heard some say like what you're saying it could be a bad thing. Um uh, but yeah, I believe uh, I know there's some Native Americans or some tribes that believe that it to see one could be considered it was it, you know, if you do see one then it means it was meant to be and mm-hmm. Like I said, it could go either way. Um, you know, it, it's like he chooses. You know, the Bigfoot, the spirit of Bigfoot, kind of chooses who he allows to uh, let him be seen. You know, all that. You know, then again, you know, a lot of people have encounters where it seems like it's an accident. But you know, then again, sometimes is it an accident? You know, <laughs> you know, yeah. because so. because the Seminoles down in Florida won't even talk about Bigfoot. Because if you remember watching Find a Bigfoot, Matt Moneymaker and him went to a Seminole tribe, and they talked to the elders, and the elders wouldn't even talk to them. So I guess Seminoles think they're a bad omen, too. You know, there's a lot of tribes out there, you know, who think they're good, and there's a lot of tribes think they're bad, you know. But much as we see them, you know, in our area, you know, I guess you call it they're used to us because whenever they cross, we're there. You know, we're camping there, you know. And they see us, and all we do is just sit there and watch, you know. And they're doing their thing, but they're still got their eyes on us, you know. So I guess we could say we're lucky to see what we see, you know. But during the day, Connie sees more than I do because they show themselves to a female before they will. That one of Fabio. I, I got her to put the camera on my shoulder, and I looked at, up there toward him. He ducked back in the bushes. I turned my head, looked the other direction, popped back out in front of Connie. Why? I don't know. But, you know, they, like I say, as far as me and Connie goes, it's a good thing, you know, because, I mean, we're looking at something that very, 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 very few people ever get to see. Now, how they feel about it, that's that's their opinion. You know, everybody has their own opinion, you know. Some people say, like Baltimore say, some people say it's a bad omen. Some people say it's a good omen. But the bottom yeah. line is, they're a human hybrid. That's the same value. What are they mixed with? Where did they come from? How long have they been here? You know, that's the main question. But till then... I'm just going to sit back and enjoy what I'm watching, you know, and teach what I want, teach what I learn, you know, because I've been doing this for quite a few years, and I will never ever stop learning because it's like an open, it's like an open book. You constantly learn something new every day. New structures, they add structures, they take away from structures. You might see, uh, we have found one spot in a creek where they had blocked it up and was catching natives as they come down the stream. Did a human do it? Not where, not where we was at, because you had to get on your hands and knees and 
and some places belly crawl through the mountain lower to get to the creeks. And that's up on Bog Mountain, up on uh, Montebello Mountain, in Vesuvius, and St. Mary's. And there's, you know how thick St. Mary's is. Yeah, I've been in a yeah, I've been in a part of it. Yeah, you know, because you can follow St. Mary's all the way up to the Blue Ridge Parkway, and there's a falls everybody calls St. Mary's Falls. That everybody goes to bring us swimming, you know, and a lot of people have experiences up in there. Last time I was up in there, I found out that the males up in there are aggressive. They don't want no one up in there because I've got growled at, had boulders stoned at me and everything, and I'll never, no. I'll stay down where I'm at. You know. But, you know, it depends on the squatch, depends on the family, depends on who you are. They can tell if you're a bad person or a good person. That's something we did learn about them, about by watching them, observing them. And studying them, you know. Yeah. And so, so, you know, I think it's a good thing. A lot of people think it's bad. Half the natives think it's a good thing, and the other half thinks it's a bad thing. So it's really split yeah. down the middle. It's kind of split down the middle on the whole kid and caboodle, you know. This is one yeah. creature that we'll never, ever figure out. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. What I think. Yeah, one thing I want to mention because I'm looking at something that was posted here on the live chat uh, by uh, user Flycatch. He posted a BFRO link, and it's uh, for Virginia documented sightings through the BFRO. Uh, he he states one. on here there's 75 reported sightings in Virginia. Now, one yeah. thing because I I replied to him on that, and my reply was I said there's more than that, Flycatch. Not everyone is willing to come forward. And I go on to say that I have had people come to me to share that have never told a soul. And that's the thing. And, and I know there's more. Um, and Fred, yeah, I, you know, is, you could probably contest to this. That, you know, that's why we put ourselves out there the way we do and advertise and broadcast yeah, exactly. who we are and what we do. Because there's people out there that have seen or experienced something that just don't know who to turn to. Uh, you know, I don't think, you know, yeah, I'm sure, you know, some might know about the BFRO. Some people don't know nothing about any Bigfoot groups. There's people that didn't even yeah, know that there was Bigfoot groups here in Virginia. I said, yeah. I said, I said we're just one of several, you know. But yeah, Virginia's a very squatchy they, state. Yeah, the uh, the Virgin the head of the BFRO for Virginia, his name is Dwayne. He's the guy that I, him and his groups the one I run out of my area twice already. I called him and gave him a report. He said I'd check it out and next thing I know I know him and his him and his group was in there at Cold Springs twice and I had to run them out twice. So Dwayne mm. is the Virginia BFRO guy. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, because a good researcher will never step on another researcher's toes in his area. Without saying, yeah. hey, mind if we go to your area? Now, if he would have said that, yeah, fine. But just to go in and say that that's his area, wrong. You know, you don't step on one. It'd be like me going to your area and say, all right, I'm claiming Daniel's area is my area. I discovered this and I discovered that. Same difference. You don't do that. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad uh, relationship and that's bad researching. Oh yeah, well, like you know, you know, you know, I come in the area, I go hike and explore and Bigfoot out there, oh, you know, and, and just like yeah, you know, it's vice versa. We know, well, we know each other, and we know that you know, it's you know, and um, yeah, of course, yeah. if I find or experience anything, yeah, I'm gonna share that openly, you know, and like just like you do, you know. So you know, yeah. between me and you, there's no secrets there, you know. Yeah, uh, well, shoot, look what look what all your dad found in that area. Lord have mercy. Oh, dad! Dad, I tell you what, dad gets excited, man. Ever since, every you know, the more and more I point out stuff to him, he's in the woods looking every time. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. is. <laughs> he's like a kid, you know. He, he he's like a little kid. Like he'll take pictures. He'll pull out his phone and he'll send it to me, or he'll wait till he sees me. He's like, "Look at this! I thought this was so cool looking." I say, "Yeah, it is," you know. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. you know, it's all, you know. But um, 
So, you know, I've come yeah. to the point where there's there's a lot of structures that we uh, we come across. And, you know, and the one type of structure I still get excited about is if I find a TP structure. And I love finding TP structures. And the, one of the best ones I found came from out of your area going down to the uh, Mill Creek Reservoir. And um, where one of the, uh, the trees that were used to make this TP, the root ball was up in the air. The root wow. ball was up in the air. Yeah. That was awesome. I got pictures of it. I'll, you'll have to zoom in. You'll be able. To, you can see it in the picture. It's pretty clear. Yeah, you know, I try to take yeah. different angles of it, but um, it's a, it's a really cool looking TV structure. And in that particular area, this part of the area where I found these at connects to the uh, the back uh, the back part of the apple orchard, off the side. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah going yeah, down yeah. the Mill Creek Reservoir Road, the, the, that that uh-huh. gravel road. Yeah. So yeah, there's some cool shit back in there. <laughs> So, yeah, there is. So, hey, Daniel, uh, uh, y'all were talking yeah. about earlier about about people going and in, uh, into uh, into your areas and um, and uh, researching and stuff like that. Uh, you know, there's a uh, one area that you know I've always told people. You know, you know, yeah, I even told you when I was in the news is uh, d- down the old Normanna Bridge. It's uh, you know, there's a lot of sightings down there. And uh, you know, you know, I, that's one of my main research areas. But you know, it's uh, you get a, and then there's sometimes that people go to that area and just to go, and uh, listen to what I hear or uh, go out there. But I, uh, what really gets me, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a young kids uh, when they go out there and uh, you know want to hear a Bigfoot or you know or just slowly start to get into it. And then so you and then uh, for me that's a big accomplishment because you know here's this little kid you know wanting to learn a little bit more about Bigfoot the the parents are taking him out there you know just sitting down there and just uh, and just checking that they could actually hear something or actually see something and yeah. if not it goes uh, you know so the kid had a wonderful experience being out there. Uh, out there, out in the outdoors, and instead of uh, spend spend the whole time uh, uh, behind a computer or just playing games, you know, right. it's uh, it's real good to it's real good to uh, to open the minds of little kids and uh, and to it tell is. them, hey, you know what? There's a whole bunch of birds out there. There's a whole bunch of armadillos down here. Once in a while, you'll see a badger, or once in a while, you know, stuff like that. But also, too, once in a while, too, you might get lucky and and come across. Uh, just Bigfoot, and uh, um, and then so all of a sudden they come up. He goes, if one comes out, he goes, uh, uh, what do we do? I said, all you got to do is just step on backwards and walk backwards and go back to y'all's vehicles or go back where y'all are at, and, you know, so just leave it alone. It, it won't bother you. So, you know, it's more afraid of uh, – he's more afraid of you than than, than the you are him. So uh, you know, there's sometimes you gotta you know talk to them like that. So because there is something else out there, you know that they have to be aware that you know, hey, if you come across this, this is what you need to do. So I kind of feel that you know a lot more of of uh, of us, you know, come should come up there and say, hey, uh, especially if a young little kid would ask you, well, what do we do if this happens? Well, you have to give them the best answer as as you possibly can. So. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, with that being said, uh, we're actually officially off air to the public. Although this the uh, it, it still continues to record, even though we're off air to the public, uh, which we do got to get ready to come to a close. And uh, be on the lookout. I will I will reshare this um, after I um, edit it and upload it to my YouTube channel, and I'll share it on Facebook. So if you guys want to share this around later, please feel free to. Um, Cool. Yeah, because I'll yeah I'll upload it through a YouTube link later. I got to uh, download it to my computer um, after the episode's set, and then uh, we you know we're gonna go from there. So, um, guys, and Fred, yeah, Fred, thank you for coming on to do this. This is awesome, and uh, well, oh, thank you. Yeah, feel free to jump on anytime. Now we we try to keep up with this every Friday night. Usually it's ten o'clock we do this, but um, yeah. yeah, we went an hour early tonight because. There's another episode that just started. Uh, I want to go hear myself because I don't know how it sounded or how it turned out after they edited it. So I'm going to go check that out. It's called The Existence of Strange Things. The link's on my timeline. So if you guys want to check that out, cool. uh, basically what we did, uh, I basically promoted the event coming up through a lot of it. That's what they had me talk about on some of it. So um, 
So, and then Sunday night, I'll be live on uh, another radio show. I think that was called the Paranormal Files. Um, that'll be at 8 p.m. It'll be live. So, and then there's another gentleman that is scheduling me uh, for another show. I'm trying to remember. I got it written down here. Uh, da, da, da. I'll have to double check. It's uh, another one. It's it's called the Pacific West uh, Radio, and uh, the gentleman just recently had a uh, story on there from a guy from New York that actually had experience an experience in the George Washington National Forest here in Virginia. Uh, so he was a yeah, New Yorker but- down here. Yeah, I thought it was pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> So, it, was, it, was, it was comical. <laughs> yeah, he was describing all everything he heard. The two guys that were with him were supposedly non-believers, but after they heard what they heard, he, they packed they their left. shit up and left. <laughs> yeah. The other guy said he stood around. He wanted to hear more. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, he was an older gentleman. He's had he claimed to have his own experiences, you know, elsewhere. So, but. I guess that's the most he's really ever really heard before until he came down here. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, you know. All right, guys. Good night, and uh, I'll talk to you all soon. All right. Sounds good. Uh, you guys have a good night, and we're going off now. So keep it squatchy, guys. Right on. All righty. Progressive presents Get Pumped, inspiration to help you do insurance stuff. Okay, time out. You're going to let your budget be the boss of you? Take control with Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay for car insurance, and we'll help you find options that fit your budget. Here's some music to get you pumped. da dong da dong da dong da dong dang dang I hear your budget laughing at you. Oh, wait, that's just those kids laughing at me. Ignore them! Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Get to Old Navy today for $1 flip-flops with your Old Navy card, plus 50% off all shorts and swimwear at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 616 to 617. Excludes in-store clearance, active shorts, licensed shorts, and licensed swimwear. Flip-flop limit 10. Select styles.